get started. Welcome to Owls After Dark. We call these episodes After Dark because owls do some of their best thinking at night. These are quick bonus episodes where Kristen and Katie talk about love, life, and the pursuit of happiness. On today's episode, we are talking about privilege. Mm -hmm. uh, Kristen has mentioned it is a privilege to have had a stroke, um, and I very much uh, am aware of the privileges that I've had as well. Um, and so we, before this, had talked a little bit about um, one of our friends, Veronica, who was on a previous episode, who asks every white man she went on a date with, how do you use your privilege for good? And I fucking love that question. <laughs> I love it too. So Kristen, how do you use your privilege for good? So I think as a Latina, like I have had to battle things because I'm a woman and I'm brown, but I'm also really well aware that I am a privileged Latina. Like I went to private school. My sisters and I were always at the best schools on the South side of Chicago. And, you know, I'm, was, I'm documented. My parents were documented. So we never had to have that fight. And my dad was very educated and was able to like help my sisters and I navigate like, you know, financial aid and things like that, that can be really difficult for other, you know, Latinos that are maybe here first generation. Um, I think for me, I try to use my privilege like as much as I can as far as like volunteering for things, especially like in Denver, I was really involved with like the Latino Community Foundation or Latina Safe House, like any way I can feel, I feel like I can give back to my community with the skills that I have is a way I feel that I can like use my privilege for good. And I really like to talk to like young girls, like um, schools and just like there's, there's YWCA had a Latina leadership program that I brought them in and gave them tours of the studio. Just because for me, I've always had my dad and my mom in my ear saying like, you can do whatever you want. And I, I grew up really believing that. And I know some girls don't have that, especially when they're coming from like a traditional Latino family where it's like women are encouraged to maybe not go to school, but like stay home and, you know, be in the kitchen, which is amazing if that's what you want to do. But if you want to go and get an education and, you know, you go to school and I remember I'm, I have always been one of the only brown women brown people in general in my classes and that can be very like hard to take in because then you're like the token diversity opinion and so if you've been told your whole life that you can't do anything else and then you go to these universities and you're the only brown person it's pretty overwhelming so I really like to go to young girls and remind them that you know you can do whatever you want and I've always thought like that's one of the reasons I wanted to be on TV and not like newspaper because I wanted other young girls younger Latinas to look up and see me on TV and be like I want to do that there's a girl there's a woman who looks like me on TV and if she can do it I can do it I mean I even growing up in Chicago like watching English news there was hardly any brown people when I grew up I mean there was like the Spanish station but I grew up speaking English so I didn't really have like anything to look so which is why in undergrad I didn't really want to go into TV for you know it wasn't until graduate school that I walked into the station I'm like oh I can fucking do this but that was by like my own accord it wasn't like I mean eventually people were like yeah you can do this you're good at it but you know it took a while um, I know white privilege right now is kind of a touchy subject, which is why we're going to cover it. And Katie, you're a very woke white woman. And I've told you that yesterday <laughs> that I feel very proud to have you like as an ally to like people of color and just as a friend, like there's a lot of things that I don't have to explain to you that you just kind of know. Aww. Um, how does that work? Yeah. <laughs> how does that, how is that? Um, you know, for me, my purpose is loving people and helping people. And, um, I never thought about intentionally, like I'm privileged and this is how I use it. Um, I am now more so, but when I think about the different careers and what I've done, I've been pretty aware. Like, I've, I've always felt different than my peers, like a little bit ahead of my time. I think part of that, I'm, I'm weird, quirky. Um, and so being quirky in 10 or 12 years old is not, no, not normal. And for me, I think about why like, I've always wanted to help the underdog because I am the underdog. Mm -hmm. uh, and what I found, so I became a teacher and I knew I wanted to teach in the inner city. And that is my privilege showing of like, oh, I'm the white person that can come and save you. Um, I was young. <laughs> 
but I intentionally took an African American history class and I took in a Latin American history class and I realized pretty quickly that textbooks were not like, I don't want you to memorize facts. I want you to be able to think about them, interpret them. And having the privilege of having this first school that I taught at be so diverse, 60% Hispanic, a lot of first generation, um, mm -hmm. even the white kids at the school were like Ukrainian first generation. It was an amazing place. Um, and they taught me a lot, but it was really cool for history is to see their perspectives. And that was the teacher I strove to be. And then I went and taught on the South side and my privilege was showing. I'm like, oh, they just need good teachers. I'll show up. And uh, although my intentions were good, I realized towards the end of the second year I was there, although I was making connections with kids and I was able to have important conversations with them and hold their agenda. For example, you take a kid's cell phone on the South side. If you are a white teacher and you think that you were teaching them a lesson by keeping it overnight, fuck you. That's your yeah. privilege showing. Like those kids knew if they gave me their cell phone, I would give it back at the end of the day. I did not want them to be unsafe at night. Um, but I was part of the system. Like I was, I was forced as a teacher to make them take standardized tests once a week. And I was forced as a teacher to tell them, if you don't go to college, you're going to be nothing, which not exactly that we say that, but we were pushing them to college where I had kids who were like, I don't want to go to college. I want, and there's so many other options for them. And that doesn't mean that they can't be something. Um, and so I left. I think when the moment I realized, damn, I'm the part of the system. Um, and I guess maybe that's the woke part <laughs> that you talk about. But for me, I just, I've always wanted to help people that feel maybe marginalized because I've felt marginalized many times, mm -hmm. um, but not for the same reason, right? And when I think about the nonprofit work I've done, uh, I worked, when I first moved here, Hoboken is a very white affluent town. The average income is $105,000. So that's average, right? That's the average? That's the average. Holy shit. Um, but when I first moved here, I moved to the sublet and I was uh, at Fifth and Jackson. And if you know Hoboken, that's right across from the housing authority. And there are people that were afraid to walk there at night. And mm -hmm. I can tell you that in the five years I've lived here, there's been one murder. They caught the man, they put him in jail. Like it's a very safe place. They're just people that don't look like you or have the same culture. Right, as right, you. Right. Um, and so I was working for a mentoring program and really where I kind of got stuck there is I felt like, man, here we are again, white people mentoring these kids. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's a very transient town. And so if you're a white man mentoring a Latino kid and then you leave because you get a new job, you're our, now you're another man that's left a kid. Right, um, right, right. So um, well-meaning white people <laughs> is how I would say that I would describe some of the, the things I've, I've done. As I've, and, um, and now I'm really passionate about that privilege for good and this platform that we're building to be able to give a voice to people who don't feel like they have a voice. Right. I think we're passionate about as well. Um, yeah. and that's really how, when I think about nonprofit and how I want to use my white privilege for good, I want to use my contacts. I want to use my skill set to build a nonprofit that actually serves the people it's intending to serve. Um, nonprofits are primarily white people on the top. And I don't want to have that. I want to build a nonprofit that actually serves the people they want to serve and that is representative of I that diverse that. community. Yeah. Um, and diversity is thought too. I think we're very, um, to have that idea of this privilege that we also need to think differently and thinking differently um, is also a privilege to have, you know, to have that diversity in your life. And I, I, I thank everyone <laughs> that, um, that gives the privilege of allowing me to be a part of their life. I mean, I think it's important, like as a white woman that you like went out of your way to get educated with these things. Not everybody does that, which is why I feel like sometimes we are where we are because um, what you explained earlier before we were recording that, like sometimes when people hear the word white privilege, and can you talk a little bit about that? I feel like that was pretty. Yeah, I, um, I am not speaking for these people because I'm not one of them, but I'm going to try to represent them. Um, I think people that get really triggered by white privilege are people that haven't, are white that have not experienced what they would consider privilege. Mm -hmm. um, 
And we just get so stuck on this of like, well, your privileges are more than mine. And what I love that you always talk about is I had a stroke and that's my trauma, but that doesn't mean that your trauma, even if it wasn't as big of a deal, you know, isn't still a problem, isn't still traumatic rather. Um, and so I think people get stuck in this idea, well, white privilege doesn't exist. People, there's just privileged and not privileged. Um, I disagree <laughs> after and from a white, as a white person, seeing what has happened to friends, like we've talked about your, um, people get, get arrested, right. That are of color versus people that are white. Um, I've seen it. Uh, so I do, I do like though, that we talk here about, you know, everyone's experience, regardless of the extremity is still their experience. And I do think that's why you have white people that are like, fuck you. And you're, you, I'm not privileged either, but it's not about you white people. <laughs> I think it's not about like being point. rich. You know, I think that's what they privilege is like being rich and like having money and cars and sure. I mean, maybe that's what they think privilege is. I don't know. I'm not white. That's what I'm just assuming. Yeah. And I feel like I don't put myself into that white privilege box because uh, I didn't grow up with money. Hmm. Oh. <laughs> We're just smiling if you're watching this video because Kristen's with her man. I am. <laughs> I'm so happy to be here. You're so privileged to be there. <laughs> I really am to like ha be able to fly right now. Like, oh my God. Yeah. And to live to be 37 for me as a white person, I don't recognize that as a privilege. Um, it is a privilege. And I, I think I am more aware of that now as I think about, you know, getting older is not a right. It is a privilege. Um, and it's a yes. privilege people don't have because we, there are people in this that take it away. Um, and that's, that's how I feel about my stroke that like, it's a privilege that I survived something that a lot that kills so many people. And now that I'm here, I still hear that it's, it is a privilege that I'm alive. And so what am I going to do with that? Yeah. Well, I want to help educate people on stroke and I want to give hope to people who are going through stroke. And that really, that's like really what powers me. And I feel like it's similar to people, like when it comes to like racial things. And I was just telling you this, like sometimes I feel like when I MC events or I'm at like corporate things for work, that I'm like representing every Latino in the USA. So I like am, you know, I'm polished. I am like on point because if they ever meet another Latino, like let's say that's like cleaning their tables, maybe they'll be kinder to them. I don't know if that makes sense, but to me it does. Yeah. Mm. I wish you didn't feel that you had to do that because when you show up unpolished Kristen and just your normal Kristen, that's my favorite. But I think like, oh, I'm fucking, I rolled out of <laughs> this podcast. I am unpolished right now. But you've seen Selena, right? Girl. Obvious. <laughs> I know. I was telling Katie, she's part Latina, but there's a scene in there where Abraham, you know, her dad is talking to them, that like when you're a Mexican American, you've got to be more Mexican than the Mexicans and more Americans than America. I feel that still to this day so much, like, you know, for like family members that have like family still in Mexico, like my dad's brother, their kids, their, my aunt, their mom has family in Mexico. So they would go back and visit all the time. And they would always, you know, when we were little, be like, well, we're really Mexican because we visited Mexico. I'm like, well, I'm not, I wasn't allowed to go to Mexico because my grandpa said that his parents left there because there's not that, I don't believe this, but he would say that they left there for a reason. Why would we go back? <laughs> so, I mean, that's how I grew up. And, um, but I, I felt like, you know, I always have to like make sure when I'm with my Latino friends that, you know, my Latina card is turned on, flipped around, like, look, because there've been so many times in my life that people have been like, you think you're white. It's like, that's not true. Like, well, look at all your friends, they're white, but that's just who I grew up with. Like I played sports my whole life. And, you know, for a lot of people, I mean, that was a privilege that my family had extra money to put us in extracurricular. And who else was in extracurricular but a bunch of like white girls and I we grew up together and they're my best friends. Like yeah. when you're small, it has nothing to do with the color of your skin. It's like who you bond with. And so I've known those women like my entire life that had nothing to do with them being white. It's just that's who I grew up with. But I have fought I've gotten into so many arguments with other Latinas that have been like, You don't speak Spanish, all your friends are white. I'm like, uh, hold it, puta no, don't even go there. Like I am Mexican. That's something that I'm very sensitive about. Yeah. But I recognize that it's been a privilege for me to like be able to have grown up like that. 
Yeah. What I, when we talk about privilege, what I love when you talk about the stroke is that I think a lot of people, white people right now are feeling a lot of guilt and shame mm -hmm. about their privilege. And I think that, I mean, guilt and shame never served anyone. I've, I mean, guilt is for the guilty people in jail right. and they doesn't even serve them. I don't think, um, I, I love the framing that, that Veronica has had of, well, how do you use it for good? I love um, that too. Because it, it exists, recognize it. And, um, and some people right now think they're doing, they're using that good because they're to March and they're using that good for their Instagram. Um, for me, I'm more, I feel like I'm leading from behind because this, first of all, I'm white and I recognize that. So for me to come in and say like, oh, let me like do this. I want to lead from behind. I want to help build a nonprofit that is diverse, that represents all mm. women. I want to help us build this podcast. Um, to represent all women. And so to segue into that, Kristen, can you tell our audience who we're going to have on Friday on our live show? Yes, Friday. We're so excited. We are going to have powerful black females in our lives that are on. One of them, we're going to, I mean, I haven't asked her yet, but I know she'll do it, is my girlfriend, Ama. She lives in DC. She is a black woman. Her parents are from Ghana. And so she's first generation. She's hilarious, but she is also a photographer and she's been covering all the protests and I think we've had Whitney on to talk a little bit about this about what it's like to be a journalist covering all of these but to also be a black a black a black female and what it's like to like remain objective in such a trying time I mean I kind of it's not the same but sometimes it's how I felt like when they were talking about building a wall and immigration and you know the detainees like I don't, or the, the camps for the kids. I mean, I am not undocumented. I have undocumented immigrants in my family, but I'm, my parents weren't undocumented. My grandparents weren't undocumented. And again, that's my privilege that I was, I have able, been able to grow up here in America without any fear. But I imagine that the pain that I felt like thinking about children, like in these camps are some of what, you know, black people feel seeing you know their peep their men get murdered by police officers but so i'm excited um yeah we're gonna have i'm on and we'll have some other black female too so that's friday um for our live conversation we go live on facebook so make sure to tune in it's gonna be a great conversation and we'd love for you guys to join in like we love when you guys have comments and we'd love to feature your comment if you have any questions I went to a Hispanic journalism conference maybe a couple of years ago, and we had this great conversation about how we can, we can, we can serve as like, like an education for like our white friends. So if they have a question about something like undocumented, like instead of me getting like aggressive to them when they ask a question, I can like explain to them why it impacts you know, me so much or why this decision maybe hurts Latinos and instead of being aggressive. But I also think that's also kind of fucked up because it's like, if I get angry, it's like, oh, she's a spicy Latina. It's like, no, I'm just fucking pissed. But it's little things like that that are weird. But I do, I feel like I, I think my white friends can't ask me questions. Like, is this weird if I say this? And, you know, I'm pretty open. I'd be like, like, I wouldn't say that. And I'm brown. So <laughs> but I think that's something that like, I think a lot of people of color, like some people of color are tired of like, oh my God, I have to educate again. Right. But I think if we look at it differently, like you can, that's like a privilege to be able to like speak to your friends, like, hey, this is kind of offensive and this is why. And hopefully you have friends that are open enough to uh, you know, feel they can ask you whatever. Yeah. And I think that's a great way to like educate and have conversations. Like we just, we had a conversation the other day about some viral videos going on and you are just like, I'm like, Hey, I think this. And you're like, Oh, I saw this. And it was just a conversation. It wasn't anything, you know, crazy. Yeah. I, um, I definitely, <laughs> I would be that friend if I have a question, like I'll ask you, I guess, but, um, you're a good friend. I have, I know that I have some friends who just get a little frustrated because people that they've maybe met in passing a few times will reach out and ask them to tell them like, well, what should I do as a white person? Like, dude, I just mm -hmm. met you twice. Like you right. don't know anyone else that's black. I'm like, that's where you start. <laughs> right. Like get a closer right. friend. Right. Make a friend. I mean, what I love about our show so far is that it's all everyone that we're able to connect with and bring on are people that we know. 
Um, but when I think about Friday's episode, I'm thinking of like, like CrossFit right now as a part of CrossFit. Um, mm. There's literally a handful of black athletes. I would love if one of those women came on our show that I don't yes. have a relationship with, but I followed her. Um, uh, Ak and Wally, if you're listening, I'm going to reach out to you because you're from Chicago. And so that, and I've been watching you crush the game since um, 2011. Uh, so it was like, a, there was nobody in the stands. It was a tiny little event. I, she's just an amazing athlete. She was the winner of Chicago and Deborah was, I think Deborah was in that conference, but I, she lives in Minneapolis. Those are the two female black athletes. Uh, I would love to have some powerhouse it's women. It's crazy on. that you can name like just two. Right. And those are the women. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And both women that because they were in the same conference and also just kick-ass athletes that I followed their careers for a while. Um, but I'm excited for our show on Friday. I'm excited too. Um, and it's, I think uh, these are good conversations to have. They don't have to be combative. They can get combative, but I think if we have more conversations like this that are a little bit more open and fluid, it can educate people. It allows people to ask questions that they might be embarrassed to ask or scared to ask. Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest, though, some of y'all white people have real fucking weird questions. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've been asked some. I bet you, what's the weirdest question you've ever been asked? You know what? I just, you know, my whole life I've been, like, the Latina friend. Like, oh, this is Chris and my Latina friend. Like, when they introduce me to, like, their parents. Or it's like, she's the Latina one. And I'm, like, the token. And I feel like that's kind of exhausting, but... I mean, whatever. I guess the weirdest question I've ever been asked. You know, I remember, this wasn't a question, but I remember in grammar school, um, we, remember when cordless phones were off the hook, you can hit the speaker? Yeah. So my girlfriend, Megan, had to call her mom to let her know that she was staying for dinner. And I remember she's like, hi, mom, I'm going to stay at Christmas for dinner. Her mom's like, what are you guys eating, tacos? She's like, no hamburgers. <laughs> but it's so weird that I remember that. Like, my stroke wiped out shit, but it. <laughs> It kept, it kept that moment in there. It's like, don't forget where you come from, girl. Like, we're leaving this one here. Well, I had the privilege to um, teach um, Black children in Chicago on the South Side, as mm -hmm. you know. And so I got to represent white people. And my favorite question was, why do you all run outside in shorts in the winter? <laughs> and why? I don't have an answer. I don't run outside in short. I don't run unless someone is chasing me. And because I'm white, mm. they're usually chasing me. That's my privilege. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, but that was, I love those questions. I actually, I if, um, yeah, some people ask dumb questions. That question I love. I have that same question. So if you are a white person in the winter, that's we don't know. Shorts, we don't in, we want to know. Yeah, we have questions. <laughs> <laughs> This Thanks is such a good in. conversation. This is so great. Um, I'm excited to continue to talk about the privileges that we recognize and how we're using them for good uh, and to bring on some amazing, outstanding women leaders who happen to be Black because we yes. want to we want to uplift you. There is not enough platforms um, for women in general, um, but particularly mm -hmm. for minority women. And we are privileged to be able to bring you this podcast today. We are. So make sure to tune in Friday. 6 p.m. Eastern time. We're all going to be on the same time zone for the first I know. I can't believe it. Usually you should see Katie and I trying to figure out time zone. I'm like, wait, is that four o'clock my time? And she's like, let me Google it. It's a disaster. It's but awful. We, <laughs> we get it. <laughs> all right. All right. Thanks, guys.